Hi. Uh, so my topic today, which I am debating with Anthony, um, is generalism in Ireland. Is it outdated? Um, so this is quite a difficult one um, for us all, because I think lots of us operate in the realm where we are both specialists and generalists. And I suppose it's difficult to be analytical about our own practices, um, whilst it's easy to be um, critical of, of how we would like the world to be. I suppose I started out this by looking at our kind of mission in the college and um, had a quick look at the RCPI mission statement. And just to kind of get us to reflect on what it is we actually do and where we want to go, um, we say that our mission is to train, educate and continuously develop doctors for current and future world health needs. And our vision is to lead excellence and quality in medical practice through world class training, education, healthcare improvements in Ireland and internationally. So I suppose anything that we argue um, is the way of the future should be taken in the context of our, our mission. And I suppose also taken in the context of the population that we serve and, um, and the patients that we look after. So Ireland has a population of 4.9 million and we're up 11% since 2008. And 40% of that population live um, in the area of highest density, which is around Dublin. Now, generally across the country, we have an extraordinarily low population density at 72 per, per square kilometre compared to the UK, our closest neighbours, who are at 269 per square kilometre. So we really are outside of the major um, metropolitan areas, very sparsely populated. Um, we have a median age of, that should be 83.2 years, um, sorry, 38.2 years for median age, sorry, and a life expectancy of 81.96 years in 2017. And that's been increasing um, ec almost exponentially over the, over the past decades. And um, we have one of the highest birth rates in Europe at 13.8 births per thousand population. And our mortality is down 10.5% since 2009. Um, in keeping with this, the proportion of our population who are over 65 has increased 44% since 2018. And this, as, you, as we all know, results in a substantially increased demand for public hospital services. And it's predicted that you know, these needs will go up by more than a quarter by in the next decade. So we really are operating in an area of growth, both in terms of population and ongoing healthcare needs. Um, and we all know that our aging patients have more complex health needs. So because of our sparse population and for lots of geopolitical reasons, we have 29 emergency departments and they cover vastly different populations and geographical areas. We have around 1.3 million um, emergency departments attendances per annum and we are extraordinarily poorly served in terms of our beds um, at about 2.77 per thousand, which is about 30% below the EU average, which is, sits at about four. Um, Mirroring this, we have the lowest number of medical specialists in the EU and indeed in the OECD. So we're at 1.44 per thousand of population versus the European average, which is 2.47. Despite this, in 2019, um, we had 19% more inpatient and day case patients compared to 2010. And we have a length of stay, which is 6.1 days which is 20% less than that uh, which we see in, um, when compared with our OECD neighbours. Um, we predict, and lots of people have predicted, that the number of inpatient public beds will have to increase um, by almost, by up to 40% um, by 2013, simply to maintain the already very low per capita bed ratio. And that's outside of COVID and all the challenges that we've had in the past year. So we know that at present there are more than 600,000 patients waiting to be seen by a consultant and that a quarter, a, million, a quarter of a million of those people have been waiting for longer than a year for their outpatient appointment. If we look here at the demographics going forward over time, this is a lot of where our challenges lie. So our patients who are over the age of 85, the proportion of them in the total population is going up. And equally, the proportion of patients over 65 is going up. And by 2040, at which point I will still be, please God, all going well, a consultant rheumatologist, we'll be looking at an even higher proportion of the very elderly and elderly. 
So all in all, we've been doing pretty well. If we look at our life expectancy in Ireland compared to birth, um, although we may give out about our health service, I know there are lots of social and economic determinants of health that also impact upon our longevity. We're not doing too badly when we compare with our OECD um, neighbours. So who does all the work? So if we look at the specialist medical pr practitioners per thousand of population in the EU when this was last looked at by the OECD and that was in 2019, Ireland sat at 1.49 specialists per thousand of population and the EU average was at 2.53. And I suppose it's worth noting when you look at this that there are countries within this where certainly we wouldn't consider them to be you know, medical marvels or anything like that, but they certainly have much higher proportions of specialists available to look after their population. Now, in Irish specialty training, um, as we all know in the RCPI, there are plenty of specialty training schemes where people have dual accreditation as part of the kind of standard SPR training. So cardiologists will often do dual, dual training and certainly amongst the other medical specialists, it is the norm to have both GIM and specialty training. So myself, I did rheumatology, you know, respiratory, nephrology, infectious disease, geries, um, gastroenterology, endocrine and clinical pharmacology all have as their standard path that, pay, that um, doctors are accredited with CCST in both a specialty um, and in also, also in general medicine. So the vast majority of the physicians in training and the people who come through our system will be aiming to have dual accreditation and will likely contribute to on-call rotas for general medicine in Ireland. Um, this means that similar to lots of the rest of us that have general medical inpatients, in addition to having lots of specialty inpatients in some cases, and also their specialty and subspecialty clinics. So in essence, by covering more than one specialty, and by two specialties I mean internal medicine being one specialty and then our own specialty, we've historically been plugging the gaps which have been created by low staffing um, in our health service. And the question we need to pose to ourselves is whether this is actually of benefit to the patient ultimately and ultimately to the health service. So I did lots of my training in the United States and I suppose there the hospitalist model um, would be considered the norm. This is where patients who are admitted via the emergency department are under the care of a hospitalist or an internist um, who is a general internal medicine doctor. Um, and then the specialty consults are sought for specific specialty issues. Um, the benefits of this are then are that it frees up the specialists for clinics, for research and teaching, and some argue results in a more holistic and patient-based experience. These physicians in the US models tend to work shifts, so 12 hours on service, um, and they tend to staff the wards overnight. Um, in teaching hospitals, they'll be accompanied by a team of residents, nurse practitioners, and physician assistants. Um, and most studies, when you interrogate the data, will demonstrate a slightly lower length of stay for the hospitalists, with some minor reductions in cost. Um, they don't see a huge difference in the hospital mortality demonstrated for those who are cared for by hospitalists versus, um, versus specialists. Um, and interestingly, on my review of the, the literature, the patient perspective on this has, has been largely unrecorded. The knock-on impact on specialty services and on things like waiting lists is also not widely reported, although I suspect that this is because lots of these countries where a specialist model is implemented don't actually have issues with medical staffing nor with waiting lists. So as I said earlier, I'm Irish trained. Um, my fellowships were both um, in the States um, and my specialty obviously is rheumatology and my subspecialty training is in lupus. I suppose for me, my specialty training and my subspecialty training, if I reflect on how it impacts my ability to practice as a physician, is that it gives me the tools and constructs for complex medical decision making and an ability to interrogate the literature in a logical way to improve my patient outcomes. Whether it's fortunate or unfortunate, internal medicine takes up a good proportion of my working time, but expansion of our consultant workforce um, even in the small ways that things have expanded since I've started in the last five years, has mean, means that my GIM commitment has already lessened. Um, and whilst it continues to be a major part of my working week, it does not overwhelm my working week. And I have ample time to address things like our waiting list, um, my subspecialty clinics, 
um, and it grants a balance that I that I hope will be I will be able to sustain and continue. So I suppose my opinion is that dual accreditation and sub and specialty training has enabled us to overcome many barriers to care in what has been a very stretched Irish healthcare system. I think specialist training is how we keep the show on the road and why there are endoscopy lists in most peripheral hospitals. It's how we've managed to maintain diabetes service, bronchoscopies and many other patient services which would not exist were our hospitals, our peripheral hospitals in particular, staffed by solely general physicians. Similarly, um, if we flip the coin, if we in other specialties did not provide a commitment to general internal medicine, we wouldn't be looking at a scenario where there were 13,500 hospital discharges per thousand of population um, and we would not be able to sustain the number and volume of patients who come through the hospital um, via the emergency department. Similarly, at present, we're not training people in purely internal medicine. We're seeking to train specialists who will do internal medicine and also offer an additional service to both their hospital and to the health service in general. So to conclude, there are very few generalists in Ireland. Um, most of us do general medicine um, in the context of being specialists. Um, and I suppose we train people with the aim that they will be both and we train people to be excellent um, in the hope that excellence in one area filters through to other areas of their practice. And it is unlikely at any point in the near future will we be able to divide the general physician from the specialist. As we look to increase our staffing levels closer to internationally recommended levels, we should look to dilute our time on inpatient service and perhaps look to dilute our GIM commitment and the time we spend focusing on our specialty and service development. And I would hope that this will have a knock-on effect on things like our waiting lists and other um, specialty um, areas where perhaps um, we have lots and lots of work to be done. Now, no Hopkins alumnus can end a talk without a uh, quote from William Osler. And, and he said, there are in truth no specialties in medicine, since to know fully many of the most important diseases, a man must be familiar with their manifestations in many organs. So Osler um, argued that we are all generalists and that to be a good physician, that one must always um, take into context the entire patient. So I suppose I'm probably agreeing with Anthony in lots of what I say. And just to finish off, I'd like to give a little plug to my own specialty um, in rheumatology. And just to say that our, us rheumatologists appear to be the happiest um, outside of work. So if there are any trainees watching, I'm going to uh, I'm going to say rheumatology is a great job. It's a great specialty and um, we'd be delighted to have you aboard. Thank you. <laughs>